Hello and welcome to the 36th episode of Tailoring in Conversation. My name is Reza and in this series I'll be talking to tailors, business owners, cloth merchants and other industry participants from all around the globe to gain a better insight into their worlds. My guest for today is Frank Shattuck. Frank is a bespoke tailor based in New York, United States. With a deep passion for tradition and the old world methods of tailoring, Frank continues his craft by following the footsteps of his masters. He cuts, fits, and makes everything all by himself. And in our conversation for today, we're going to be talking about exactly that. So let's get going. Frank, where, where, where did you grow up? If, if me and you were youngsters and we were kind of like kids playing around at 10 years old or something like that, where would we be? We'd be in Syracuse, New York, or we'd be mm. in uh, the country town of Casanova, New York. Right, right. So yep. what, what, what are the, the things that we're doing at that time? Oh, boy. The statute of limitations is gone, so I guess I could probably tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we were egging houses and throwing snowballs at cars and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> we're going hunting, fishing, skiing, mm. making maple syrup, mm -hmm. stuff like that. I did it's, see that on your Instagram. Do, do you still make maple syrup? Yep. Yeah. Just a few, about a gallon a year. Mm -hmm. A gallon a year takes 50 gallons of actual sap to burn it down to one gallon. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. Where do you get the trees from? Apple trees, right here, right in the right in the yard. So anyone can drill in them and kind of like extract the. You have sand? a maple tree, you can drill into it, and yep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so Frank, where where did your interest in in crafts come about? Because I know you're a carver as well. You carve uh, things from wood. Uh, yeah, um, I was always I always work with my hands, and uh, I started carving wood, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the tailoring came about when I was working at a real estate company in downtown Syracuse, mm -hmm. which I hated. What so did you I do? So I go to the morning real estate meeting and then go to the, this old tailor shop, mm -hmm. the Stester Brothers Tailor Shop just down the street. They made my great grandfather's coats, mm -hmm. suits, and my both of my grandfather's suits. So I would go there and hang out with them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one day, an old friend of my grandfather's came in and said, Frankie, you don't want to be a real estate. You should be a tailor. And that's mm -hmm. how it started. I didn't want and to be a tailor. I just said, yeah, okay, I'll do it. How old were you at the time? About 20. 20, okay. And so you, you, you seem to have spent a lot of time with your grand, grandfathers. What, what, what sort of work did they do? What, what was their... Well, uh, uh, one was... One the, the the one was real estate. The mm -hmm. other one died before I was born. And my great I great see. grandfather died before I was born. But my my grandfather was a real estate guy. And he was a very dapper guy. Mm -hmm. I I so, never saw him without a tie. Never. Mm. Never. He was fishing I, everything with a tie on. Never saw him without a tie. Even in pictures when he's on a fishing boat. He's got a yeah. tie and a hat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So what did your parents do? <clears throat> My dad was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, just a mom. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. Okay. So I just kind of happened into, I just kind of happened into tailoring. There's no connection. Mm. You know, there's no connection. I just started doing it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is when it I something started doing it, I knew that's what I was going to do. It's not like, well, I'll try this and see if I like it. It's like, no, that's it. Mm -hmm. It's sort of clicked. Yeah, that was it. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you can't you can't do it half. If you want to see if you like tailoring, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. Not going to be a thing. How how long did your apprenticeship take? Well, I started the, the, really my apprenticeship. Say I started in about 1980 or so. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel I knew enough to go out on my own and make a complete suit by myself. That means taking the measurements, drafting the pattern, and doing mm -hmm. everything 
for 17 years. 17. Yeah. So when I see these guys with their, I see these guys with their diploma, they went, they took an online course for six months and they're tailors. It's like, okay. (laughs) I was still sweeping floors at six months. I didn't even buy it until I was six months watching. So yeah, it took 15, 15 years anyways. And, and, uh, I would still always uh, go to Raphael mm-hmm. up the street and ask him stuff. Just mm-hmm. ask him stuff about it, you know? Ask him what to do and stuff like that. And then uh, I actually moved back in with Raphael. So mm-hmm. I was, if he was still around and he still mm-hmm. had a shop, I'd still be apprenticing with him. I'd still be, happily be the apprentice. Okay, I have a few questions already. This is super interesting. So the vibe I get from you is that you are the ultimate archetype of an apprentice. I've never met anyone like you who has oh, yeah. said who who comfortably comfortably said I was an apprentice for 17 years. So yeah. so what I'd like to ask you is you know, can I just say something? Sure. I still, occasionally, maybe once a year. Do you know Jeffrey Duddich? Yeah, I, yeah. I actually interviewed him. Interviewed uh, yeah, him. Yeah, he's great. He's, yeah, he's great. I still like. I asked him. Uh, what did I ask him a couple of years ago? How to make a spalacamichia shoulder there, and he told me how to do it. And then. Uh, uh, what else did I? Oh, I asked him about a pagoda shoulder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to make one, but I just was curious. So, and he told me. So, I mean, I, I'm kind of still an apprentice. I'm still asking uh, him what to do. Mm-hmm. And if so, I where does that come him, from? Where Where does that uh, mentality come from? Is it Is it how you were raised, or is it oh, your? You want to learn? How, the The tailor tailoring's the universe out there. Mm-hmm. I like. You take Tonino Cristoforo, who was a tailor I worked with, and he was with Raphael. Or you Mm. take Raphael. The stuff they know, I don't know. I know how to do basic things. And I like the way I do those basic things better than anybody else does them. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the stuff they could do, just glance at a customer and know what to do. Mm -hmm. And Raphael at 65, he didn't know how to make a full dress. You know, full dress, mm-hmm. the evening, the evening full dress. Yeah, and Tonino did. So Raphael set out at sixty-five years old to learn how to make a full dress: mm-hmm. the white PK vest, the cutaway, or whatever it is. The foot, the it's not the cutaway. The morning suit was the other one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he learned how to make that, and that's the hardest thing in the world to make. In mm-hmm. three or four years, he had learned how to make one as good as anybody else. At 65 years old, to have that mm-hmm. innocent child, childlike curiosity and will to still make it. Mm-hmm. So it's the mentality of the being in your craft. You never, you never know, you never know how to do it. If you knew True. everything, you'd never have to do a fitting. Just take a photo and yeah, <laughs> you wouldn't have to. Why do you do fittings? Because you don't know. Why do you do fittings on a customer that you've made five suits for already? Because mm-hmm. you don't know. Mm-hmm. Would Every you say you've stuff. always been like this? Yeah, I think. Oh yeah, Cur- I think, curious. I think, uh, I think. I think a lot of people in the past. I mean, any good craftsman is like that. Any good. Cra- it's nothing special with me. Mm. any good craftsman anybody who works with their hands and loves what they do is exactly like me mm. so i'm i'm not one of these guys that goes that i'm the i'm the best tailor in the world i'm an expert no i understand i understand so frank what do you think an apprenticeship does that a tailoring school cannot even if they provide all the technical basic foundations that one needs what is it about an apprenticeship that just isn't replicable uh it because it's being around it you absorb it in a tailor shop Mm -hmm. and you learn it up here in a school but if you can go to a good school 
mm-hmm. they can give you the re- they if you could find a really good school like i went to a a school in uh philadelphia years ago mm-hmm. to learn drafting because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. the tailors i worked with they knew how to draft mm-hmm. when they were kids but they stopped they had block patterns mm-hmm so I went to a school in Philadelphia that's no longer there, and I learned how to draft a pattern, and I learned how to make a pair of pants. Mm-hmm. Um, so you you can learn if you find a good school, you can learn, but you got to be there. You got to go and it, it's like college. You go there and you learn, and then you go out into the real world, and then you start learning. Yeah, yeah. I've always thought that you know an apprenticeship is. Um, a bit mixed up because y- when you're doing an apprenticeship, you're not, you're also building your character, right? And so there are moments where you have to kind of like bite through things and moments that are going to be challenging more than a tailoring school would be. And I think that's where you kind of like develop more your character. But in a tailoring school, the focus is just on the techniques and you learn the techniques, but you don't learn the relationship between the techniques and yourself kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. You'd learn, well, you, you learn the foundation. You, you can't. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, like if you draft, if you draft a pattern, mm-hmm. it looks great. And then mm-hmm. you go to put it together. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's, maybe the pattern's perfect, but you didn't put it together right. Mm-hmm. I'm still, I'm still figuring out every sleeve I set. I'm still figuring it out. Mm-hmm. And so I take it out and put it back in and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, every shoulder, every mm-hmm. suit, you know, so it's, you can draft a pattern. You can like some, a block pattern. You can have a great block pattern. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's just, it's just a piece of paper. You have to, you have to bring it alive. Mm-hmm. So in the time that you spent with, with, the people who taught you and the, and the masters you were at. And, I, I, and I've noticed Raphael. Raffaele was one of the prominent figures in, in your journey. What did they instill in you? What was the, the kind of, uh, what were the standards that they provided you with so that it was always with you? You know what I mean? Yeah, I think I, think I had those standards. You had them. In. And they, they recognized that in me, and then they so then they wanted to teach me. So what they were those standards? They knew I wasn't just trying it out. They knew I wasn't just seeing if I liked it. They knew it. I'm in it for the long haul. Mm-hmm. Let's let's teach this. And Raphael was special, and so was Tonino, because mm-hmm. they were willing to teach. Mm-hmm. A lot of tailors are not willing to teach you because they have the. And it's good. I'm not saying it, it's a good thing. It's charming. The small town mentality. If I teach this kid what I know, he's going to take my job. And a lot of tailors had that mentality. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Raphael didn't. Raphael was, uh, and Tonino, they loved it. They, you know, they mm-hmm. loved, they loved to teach because we had fun. Mm. We had fun. What what sort of a what sort of standards did you have before you went there? What what was the th- what were the things that they recognized in you? Uh, hand hand stitching, is mm-hmm. hand stitching. Uh, small, precise. Do it right. Do hand stitching. Spend all day applying a facing by hands, or two days, or mm-hmm. whatever. It's it's not the end result is not the goal. The end result is not the goal of the day. The end result is do this part right. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> I've I've seen some some of your work on Instagram uh, of the videos and the photographs that you post and the canvases that you make, and uh, it, they are very structured. And I I assume that they are so structured because the fabrics that you use are very heavyweight. Like you say in the Anthony Bourdain documentary, you you use fabrics that deserve the craft that you put in there. It's not that I like heavy cloths. My favorite cloth ever used to be the old lesser tropicals, which I believe was eight ounce. That was an eight ounce cloth that draped like a 15 ounce. 
It was mm-hmm. hard. You could squeeze it. It would bounce right back. Mm-hmm. So it's not that I necessarily like heavy cloths. It's that nobody makes anything under a 10-ounce cloth that I will use today. Nobody. Mm-hmm. Um, if they did, I would use it. They used to have the J&J Menace Rangoon, which mm-hmm. was eight and a half, nine ounce. I loved it. I made everything from that cloth. Mm-hmm. Any suit I made or any suit Raphael made from it is still kicking around somewhere. Mm-hmm. But nobody makes a good light cloth that I will use at that weight. But mm-hmm. I use Fox Air. Mm-hmm. And I, if Fox Air was around 30 years ago or 20 years ago when I was using the Rangoon, mm-hmm. I'd be absolutely just as happy to use that cloth as Rangoon or the old lesser. Mm-hmm. Well, Fox so, Brothers is lovely. Not that I like heavy cloths. Mm-hmm. It's that most cloths today are nowhere near what they used to be. The old J and J Menace, uh, Howard Hardy, mm-hmm. Lesser. Mm-hmm. None of them are close to what they used to be. Because I have all the old books, mm. so I can compare them, and I compare them by. Every once in a while, I go and compare the old books just to keep it in my my hands. What you mean, old books with old fabric swatches? Yeah. So I go What and I can grab I can grab hold of a an old Lesser Tropicals at mm-hmm. eight ounce and say, yeah, mm-hmm. that's what it used to be. Yeah. <laughs> it it would drape beautifully. It would last for a long, long time. Mm. So it's not necessarily that I like heavy cloths. It's that I'm. Uh, there's there's no, nothing under uh, a nine ounce that's made well today. Nothing mm-hmm. up. In fact, I believe Fox Air is nine and a half, ten ounce. So you use a lot of Fox Brothers. Are, which other companies do you work with? Which I, other I fa- only use from Fox Brothers um, Fox Air and their and their heavyweight flannel. That's the, the only. Pardon? That's the only fabrics you use. That's about the only fabrics I use from Fox. But I don't see. I mean, I know they have other really good fabrics. I just don't see the reason to go experimenting with them. I, oh, I, got, I see. And I will use uh, uh, the greatest cloth I've ever used. I, I I set out on a. I set out to try to find a mill that could make me old cloth. Old mm-hmm. style cloth, old lesser sixteen ounce feel, the old good old stuff. Yeah, and I really did. I, you can go back on my Instagram, and I'm asking this. I'm begging. Anybody know a mill in England that can do this for me? Mm-hmm. And uh, by chance, somebody sent me a piece of cloth. And when I first fe- fe- held it, I said, "That's it." And I'm really hesitant to tell what it is because it's kind of my secret. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <laughs> I respect that. I respect that. So, um, from the people you've you've worked with and and the things you've seen, um, what would you say make? Who do you see as an authentic tailor? Because nowadays we have a lot of tailors around, and everyone has a different style and a different marketing program. There's a, a different- lot there. There's there's authentic tailors in Naples. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't do what I do, and I don't do what they do. Mm-hmm. What they do, I don't. Uh, I I I appreciate what they do. I appreciate the craft in it. I appreciate that they accomplish through their craft of what they set out to do, mm-hmm. and it took craft to get there. Mm-hmm. But it's not what appeals to me. So there's a lot of good craftsmen. The style, I I don't like, and and I wish uh, there's one guy. I forget the tailor's name, but he makes for a guy named Giovanni Alfieri, <laughs> mm-hmm. and he I think is a great tailor. He's in the uh, in uh, Naples, I believe. I can find that out for you afterwards. I really like what he does for this particular customer. Mm-hmm. And I know there's a lot of tailors. I just can't remember their names in uh, China. There's mm-hmm. some guys in China that I really like what they do. Mm-hmm. But I, 
if you notice on Instagram, you'll only see suits on perfect size models, perfect skinny guys that are, you know, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta yeah. look for the oblong guys that are hard to fit. I mean, that's, that's fitting, but there mm -hmm. are tailors. There are good, there are tailors out there that are, mm -hmm. that are good. What are the things you look at when you are assessing someone's work? What what are the collar balance? Collar first. Collar first. Look, very few people know how to. They know how to set the collar. Mm -hmm. They know how to put the collar on. Mm -hmm. Got The pattern has to be balanced to put the collar on, and there's a lot of. And also, the collar can be put on perfectly, but if you have mm -hmm. too much pad, maybe mm -hmm. drift. Mm -hmm. Or, mm -hmm. uh, well, if you have too much pad, you can have as much pad as you want, but you have to accommodate for it mm -hmm. in the height of the armhole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if the armhole's not high enough, the collar's mm -hmm. going to drift off. And mm -hmm. occasionally, you know, no matter what suit you have on, if you're mm -hmm. reaching forward or something, the collar's going to move a little. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, I definitely look at the collar first. I don't care about style mm -hmm. or if the collar fits, if the collar's right on the guy's neck, mm -hmm. then the guy, then it's good. And, and, and I like a high, high ish armhole too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the balance has to be good. You can't have your front lifting the front. A lot of fronts lift. And that's often from a short back, the back short and it pulls it up. And that's also the reason the collar will drift off. Mm. You know, so what, I one, of, <clears throat> one of the things I thought was that if a, if a jacket, for example, or any garment, let's say, but more, more so with, with jackets, um, if a jacket is, uh, is well cut and well balanced, um, it usually <laughs> does have some sort of a style in itself, purely in itself, because of... Exactly, yeah, it's elegant. It's a strange exactly. thing, right? Because... Well, yeah, the, if it fits, if everything's done, if it's not overdone with style, mm. but it fits you like a tailored jacket should, it goes, the the engineering and the architecture in the pattern mm -hmm. is right for your individual shape. There's an elegance to it already, mm -hmm. already. Yeah, 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 yeah. I completely agree. I completely agree. You know, that's all that the old English bankers wanted. Mm -hmm. The old English bankers, the old, you know, they didn't want a whole bunch of style, but mm -hmm. they wanted something it had to fit. Mm -hmm. It couldn't, mm -hmm. it had to be precise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and do you think... That's the ultimate style uh -huh. right there. So I assume that you do, when you're making something, you're not bothered with style at all. You know that if it's correct, it will have its style already. Uh, well, I do add on style, lapel width, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, pocket height. Yeah. Stuff, stuff like that. And, and, mm -hmm. my, and uh, a word that's overused, but mm -hmm. silhouette. What what it, what it should look like on the individual customer, and my suits come out a certain way, mm -hmm. so it kind of has my style that I don't put into it on purpose. Mm -hmm. They just come out the way I make a suit. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 very interesting because the first time I saw I saw your work was probably four or five years ago in the documentary that you did with Anthony Bourdain. And right. then and then I only saw you uh, in a few scenes, but you said you said two things that I really liked. And that was that you use fabrics that deserve the the, the, the work that you put into the garment and yep. that one has to marinate for at least 10 years to 15 years in the whole craft to be able to set out on their own. Set out and, on your own. If you yeah. want, to, if you want to make the whole, like you, you could go and learn how to make a, a coat front in five years, and you can go and work for somebody and make coat fronts, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. good. That's great. But uh, to learn how to do everything the old-fashioned way, that an old mm -hmm. Sicilian tailor would say, that's good. 
it's good. He does good work. It's, mm-hmm. it's going to take that long to do it. It's yeah, gonna, yeah. And I always say, if you want to learn to be a tailor, sweep the floor in the tailor shop. Mm-hmm. That's how you learn to be a tailor. Sweep the floor in the tailor shop. Can you can you <laughs> explain why that is? Because then you're a part of the tailor shop. Mm-hmm. You're part of the tailor shop. Sweeping a floor in a tailor shop, at least the tailor shop I was in, was an honor. Mm. It, the top tailor would get up and sweep the floor. Like mm-hmm. Raphael had a tailor, Joe. He made the most beautiful. He, Joe from Naples. That's what I call him. Joe from Naples. He made beautiful coat fronts for Raphael. Mm-hmm. If you get up and start sweeping the floor, no, no, that's my job. I I sweep the floor. I sweep the floor. It's so if it's just you're you're part of the tailor shop. Mm-hmm. You know, I I I I saw some of your um, canvases in, uh, a while back, and I didn't realize that you were the same Frank in the documentary, and uh, I I saw it and and I thought. What the hell is going on here? All these pieces of horsehair just put on top of each other and, and layered and layered. And then I saw a, ja- a, a, a finished garment that you had posted. And I thought, how is that the canvas of this coat? That's because it was really beautiful. I, I really liked the, the shapes and the sleeves and the volumes and everything was kind of like flowing into it. And I thought... Something very interesting is going on there. And then later, you did an interview with a friend of mine, uh, and you said, "You said your handwork is a tragedy if the coat doesn't fit." And, right. And I and I and, and I thought that was exactly the proof of that. And I thought, "Ha, ah, this is very interesting because you focus most of your energy on the fit, and you emphasize that all the time." Um, I do. I do. And, yeah. And, and you don't play around uh, in in like a kind of like fancy way around, you know, uh, playing around. I mean, I tend to do that, you know. Uh, you, uh, if you have seen the inside of the canvases that I make, I tend to spend a lot of time creating themes and colors and play around with that. And I've had moments where I made something and I, you know, didn't get the fit right or whatsoever. And then I, I had to think of your quote. <laughs> and I thought, my... <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> I mean, I see a lot of people, they have all these, these buttonholes. I couldn't make the buttonholes I see the Italians make. In the, if, I, if I started when I was 20 and worked till I was 80, mm-hmm. only trying to make those buttonholes, I could never do it. I just mm-hmm. couldn't do it. I, I don't know how they do it. I could never do it. Um, yeah, I'm not, I, I, I'm, 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 uh, Every stitch has to do its job. Every mm-hmm. stitch you put in, you can't be thinking about the next stitch. You got every stitch has to do its job, and every stitch mm-hmm. you put in, mm-hmm. you hold the fabric a certain way to make that stitch cooperate the way you want it to cooperate. Yes, and I just yes. want to say on all those uh, canvases, mm-hmm. all of that I bet was one of the hardest, not hardest, but most intricate things to learn how to do is to make the canvas that I make. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really learned with the old Sester brothers in Syracuse, how Mm -hmm. to make a canvas. Is that how they made it? Pardon? Is that how they made it as well? They made it like I, they made it like I made it. And that Raphael was like, I remember him saying, when he saw me making a canvas, he said, this kid knows things in his, in his Argentine accent, his accent. This kid knows things because he mm-hmm. knows how intricate and mm-hmm. specialized making a good canvas is. Mm-hmm. So all those canvas you see that I make, mm-hmm. there's cuts and yes. sprays and you throw it over the shoulder and... Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of shape put in there mm-hmm. and I see other people. One, I canvas, I just saw of an English tailor and his, I'm just like, this guy, this guy must've seen in a picture how it's supposed to look. And that's how we did the canvas, but it's not right. It's not doing anything. It's dead. Mm-hmm. It's flat. It has mm-hmm. no, look. 
And also the way I make a shoulder, you could look at all of my suits. Mm -hmm. And I had somebody comment, that's a real Roman shoulder you have. Mm -hmm. And I didn't say anything. I'm, that's, but there's no pad in it. Mm -hmm. It's straight and strong, but there's no pad. And that allows you to make the armhole a little bit shorter mm -hmm. and making a rope sleeve. Mm -hmm. And you make the armhole a little bit shorter. Part of it, you don't, you're not going to get the pulling across, which I mm -hmm. detest. Mm -hmm. People make these, they look great on mannequins, their rope shoulders, and mm -hmm. they're pulled tight and they look great. But you put them on, it's not, it's yeah, not it good. Breaks. They break, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I don't like. So for my rope shoulders, I have the, I shorten the armhole a little mm -hmm. by not using pad. Mm -hmm. The no, not using pad also keeps the collar on a little better. In my mm -hmm. opinion, some someone may disagree with that, and they may be right. Um. So, yeah, that's how I make my canvas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've I always I really, I really <laughs> build up the shoulder, but I also do softer canvas. I'm making I made a softer. If you look now on the Instagram, there's a or no, I didn't put this on the Instagram yet. A blue fox tweed, mm -hmm. which is a little softer. It's got a little softer look to it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> also, going on the rope sleeves, rope sleeves are very tricky. You have to stuff as mm -hmm. much folds in them as you can, but you have to know how to add that onto the pattern. You have to know where to add the, mm -hmm. the more volume onto the top sleeve. You have to know where to add that. Mm -hmm. You have to stuff as much fullness in there as you can. This is how mm -hmm. I do. It. This mm -hmm. is how I like to do it. This is what I think is the best way to do it. And then don't put a lot of wadding in. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have a rope sleeve, but there's mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. raining down that you have on a spell of kamich there, however you yeah. say it. The shirt yeah, sleeve. Yeah. But I just don't want any pulling across in my in my sleeves. And I'll I'll do anything to avoid that. So do you put any wadding in your sleeves? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. I put one uh mm. well depends. Sometimes I, I use more than others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll use more than others. But yeah. yes, I yeah. do wadding. Yeah. Yeah, I like the overall look of 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 what you make, man. It's and what I've kind of like uh learned from it in, in 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 a in a strange way is that they look very uh sharp and crisp around the edges and there are a lot of accents and i guess part of it comes because of the structure that you put in there and part of the good cloth selection that you make and the combination of that and also um you you tend to fit with this with a particular view which i think is kind of like more in line with how it should sit on the body rather than what style it should be. You know what I mean? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And every time I listen to my customer to take it in, mm -hmm. it, it ruins it. it. It ruins it. Except not always because I made one for a guy whose wife said it needs to be taken in a little. And I took it in a little and, and she was right. <laughs> <laughs> So she was right. It should have been taken in a little and it fit him yeah. better. It looks better now. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you always learn, you know. When did you start uh, doing fittings on Skype? Because you told me that you do Skype fittings. When did you begin started, to do that? I started about three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. A guy in uh, Argentina wanted one, wanted mm -hmm. one, of my, one of my suits. So it turned out great. Mm -hmm. It just FedEx is extremely expensive and customs is a real pain, mm -hmm. but we got it done and it turned out great. And then I've slowly honed how to do it. Mm -hmm. I, so what is the process like? If do, how, how often do you send something out for a fitting and how do they send it back? Or what's the process oh, all, like? All the time. Uh, what I do is I'll say, take your measurements. I'll tell them how to take the measurements. Okay. Give me your height. I use three measurements. Mm -hmm. I don't do all that nonsense that you see 
these tailors, I don't want to name any names, but they I like understand. take all these measurements and I'm looking at them and I'm saying that's all for show. Mm-hmm. It's all for show. You need chest, waist, seat, mm-hmm. and his height. And you do the mm-hmm. rest with your eyes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You can do the strap with your eyes. Mm-hmm. If he's got square shoulders, he has a shorter strap. If he has mm-hmm. slope shoulders, he has a longer strap mm-hmm. and uh, just uh, all this, all these measurements I see these guys taking. I'm like, that, you're going to just write those down and uh, you're not going to do anything with them. It's all for show. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm sorry. What was the question before I went off there? <laughs> the question was, when did you start Skype fittings? I think it was about 2018, 2017 or 2018. Mm-hmm. And then you told me about the process of how you do the, the fittings. Oh, yes. And how then I, you so you, I walk you through how to take the measurements. Mm-hmm. And then uh, through your photos, I mm-hmm. look at your photos. I study your physique. You send me photos of yourself in a T-shirt, front, side, and back. Mm-hmm. Study those photos and the measurements. And I'll make a uh, muslin fitting. I'll make you a canvas and a mm-hmm. muslin fitting. Send it to you. Mm-hmm. And then you send, take photos of that. Mm-hmm. pin where i've marked to pin it mm-hmm. and, uh, if i think we need to i'll do a skype uh a video we'll talk mm-hmm. on the zoom i invite skype mm-hmm. and quite often i'll do another one you you mm-hmm. send that back to me and i'll adjust the pattern this is mm-hmm. after i make your pattern i make your yeah. pattern yeah and maybe do another one mm-hmm. and then uh make the coat with no sleeves send it out Mm-hmm. and then finish from there and that's only on the first suit mm-hmm. then on the second suit we have all that groundwork is all laid it's all done right so i will uh sometimes send a fitting you know for the following suits i may have no sleeves mm-hmm. or i may finish it completely and send it knowing that i may have to go through the process of taking out the completely finished sleeves and putting them back in but that's Sure. It's it, it's a day's work that I have to do, mm-hmm. uh, possibly. Mm-hmm. How did you? Because uh, <clears throat> you, you you say that you're an old world tailor, uh, yeah. But 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 Skype is pretty new world. How did you I make that? How did you accept the, the 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 that technology onto the the old world ways of doing things? <laughs> You know, because because I can imagine no, someone. No, it's a good. No, it's a good. It's a good question. This is where <laughs> modern technology has made it possible. Like, I could mm-hmm. not, like, where all my expensive customers would be in New York City. Mm-hmm. I could not make these suits in mm-hmm. New York. City. I couldn't pay the rent in New York City to make one suit a month or one and a mm-hmm. half suit. I, I couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. There's no mm-hmm. longer any place. Mm-hmm. I could rent in New York City for eight hundred dollars a month, like I used to. Nowhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, I'm sorry again. Give me the question again. I keep going off. Sure. Oh, no, how that's do fine. I justify it? How do I yeah. justify it? <laughs> because it works. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it yeah. works. It it mm-hmm. works. The the end product is just the same, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's still using my Accio, mm-hmm. the old. Italian tailors would go. Mm-hmm. How did you know to do that? They just go like this. Yeah, yeah. I use my eye that I've learned over years and years and years and years mm-hmm. of assessing a customer. Mm-hmm. The second he walks in the door, or the second mm-hmm. I see the photograph. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. It's still, it's still the same. So it's still the same thing. So are you going to let me off the hook on that? No. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> well, well, I what I wonder is what I would like to ask you is what other technologies would you use if they would work? None to get to my finished coat, none. No, no, nothing. Nothing. You use sewing machine, right? I use a straight I uh, use a Singer 231 80-year-old straight stitch mm-hmm. machine. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. So I just do this. The straight seams are done by hand or by machine. By machine, okay. Sleeves, colors, you do with hand by hand. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, okay. Sometimes I don't 
do, I don't want to lie. Sometimes I do not do my uh, sleeves by hand. Okay. It, is there? Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I do. If I, I usually do. If I have a lot of fullness, it has to be trapped. I see. I see. But sometimes I, see. I don't. Sometimes I don't. Okay. 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 Do you do you think that do you think that social media and seeing the tailors putting out the work has influenced your work in in any way? I I wouldn't be able to I wouldn't be here talking to you right now if it wasn't for Instagram. That's true. That's true. That's very true. Because I get uh, so many people see me see my stuff and uh, mm -hmm. I I wouldn't is that what you meant by the, the by the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you could also say, uh, have they? Have you seen other things that tailors do that you thought, oh, maybe I should do that as well? Uh, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. What? I just saw. I saw. You know who I think is a good tailor too is Thomas Mo Mahan. Is that how you yeah. say it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw him on Kirby Ellison's uh, um, documentary there. I like Kirby mm -hmm. Ellison too. I like him a lot. Mm -hmm. and i thought wow this guy he's really good the coat he was wearing for himself of course he's mm -hmm. a tailor going to make sure he looks great but you mm -hmm. can be a tailor and want to make sure you look great and you still don't yeah but to, to wear to to be wearing the coat he was wearing with the high armholes the collar was perfect the collar never moved mm -hmm. the chest was right close and it never opened mm -hmm. so i thought he he's a good tailor but i saw his uh some of his breast pockets are more leveled than mine. And I said, I like that. It's, that's nice. It's not as, mm -hmm. it's a little more staid. It's a little mm -hmm. more old world. Mm -hmm. So I, sometimes I, I, so I incorporated that into a suit, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I'm sure a lot of other things too. Yeah. 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 Do you, um, would you say you're, t in that case you would be, taking smaller style details in, in consideration for your own work or would oh, you sure. also, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And anything, if you, any, you, if you look at my suit, anything you see on my suit, I didn't come up with. Mm. There's nothing original about any, anything I make. Mm. It's What's, all, uh, it's all been done before. And it's just me taking a bunch of things I like or feel mm -hmm. comfortable doing mm -hmm. and uh, doing them. It's it's not for a it's it's not my style. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. what I happen to do. It's what happens yeah. to come out of my shop. Yeah, 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 yeah. How um, how did you get into carving uh, shorebirds? I've been carving wood for fifty years. Right. Yeah. So Why I, shorebirds? Um. Well, they kind of evolved into shorebirds because I had little pieces of wood left over mm -hmm. and I just started carving them. Mm -hmm. That's why I know I just kind of, it, it, it's, it, and they just started to really take their own little shape. I see. Do you, do you make a lot of those per year or do you just do whenever you feel like it? I've been doing one. I'm I'm getting my shop back up. Okay. My my uh, carving shop back up. So I was yeah. usually doing one a week or so, but then I stopped, and now I'm, I'm going to start doing them again. Because mm -hmm. it really helps the tailoring too. Well, so that's you, interesting. Yeah. You stop tailoring; it has to be very precise. Mm -hmm. There's no room for with me for creativity or. Mm -hmm. going off doing what the fabric or what this suit wants to be. It's got to be mm -hmm. like a little carving bird. Mm -hmm. you just scrape it with the file one way and it creates a line and you say, Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. the, the little birds come out the way they want to come out to be. The oh, suits that come is out really... the way they have to be. They come that's... out the way they have to the suits that's have to really be a certain way. Mm -hmm. The suits mm -hmm. have to be a certain way. So why why would you not do that with the suit as well? No, you can't because the suit 
the suit has to be a suit. It has to fit. Yeah. And it has to be simple. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, every suit I do actually comes out different than any other suit. Mm -hmm. But that's just because that's the way it came out with me following the rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or the mm -hmm. cloth is different or I did more stitches in it one day and less in the other. The mm -hmm. canvas, every canvas is a little different. Mm -hmm. But it's Do still you use different canvases. Can... No, I don't. No, you if I'm making a heavy, top, if I'm making a heavy top coat, I will. But I use a medium weight canvas mm -hmm. and hair cloth. I use a medium weight hair cloth. Mm -hmm. And I put a heavyweight hair cloth if it needs it in the shoulder. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see. So, I see, I see. so uh, you know, I what I like what I liked about what you said is, um, you know, the birds come out the way they want to come out, and the suit has to be a very specific way because yeah. it has to fit. So that automatically makes making a suit more of a technical endeavor. Absolutely. And, car and carving a bit more artistic, correct? Well, it's artistic, but uh, it, the, the carving's artistic, but the the uh, the birds have to, they, they're not abstract. Is that the word? They, mm -hmm. uh, they still look like birds. They still have their own, they're still obviously, they're not, it's not modern mm -hmm. art. No, I see. It, you know what I'm saying? They still yeah. have to make sense to the eye. They still have to have mm -hmm. natural elegance. Mm -hmm. They have to, they have to, you don't know, you, you don't want to, they have to figure out what it is. Just like, that's a little bird, you know? Yes, 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 yes. Do you think that there can be art in tailoring as well in um, suits? Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I always say outsiders say it's art, mm -hmm. but our tailor knows it's all craft. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. he knows he had to spend time learning everything is every stitch is where it has to be and where he learned to put it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i mean you can make uh, a different lapel or you can make r really hacking pockets or yeah mm -hmm. there you you can get creative but it's nothing that hasn't been done before by somebody else mm-hmm mm -hmm. So it's to, is it, if you ask me, is tailoring art, I say no. But if mm -hmm. someone says tailoring is an art, they're right too. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. like Michelangelo carving stone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has to come out uh, uh, the way it came out. It's yeah. Of course, it's art. Of course, it's art. But to him, it's pounding the, the chisel on the stone. It has to. It has to be a certain way. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I, I, that might make sense. It might not. I don't know. No, it makes perfect sense because the, it's you have something like having a vision and then having the technical ability to put that vision into practice. Yeah, and the vision is what it has to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the little uh, birds can come out any way they want. True, true, yeah. But not a suit. So it has to come out right. But then I, you'll I, always I, say, I like this suit. This is my favorite suit of the suits you made me. I'm like, well, I don't know why. Cause I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah. Made yeah. it just like the others. So, so how did you get into acting then? Oh I God! Wonder. Yeah, wow, I forgot all about that. What? How, so how how did that go? I was in my boxing gym one day, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had a friend, Gary Hope, who was a five-time mm. Golden Gloves boxing. He won the Golden Gloves in New York five times. So he said, I'm going to my acting class. And he took me with him. Yeah. And uh, the teacher made me get up and do something. And he said, yeah, you're good. You, I mean, you, you, you could do this. Yeah. And boom, I knew right then, just like tailoring. I'm like, boom, okay, I'm going to crack this nut. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out the secret of doing it. Mm -hmm. Took me years to figure out the secret of doing it. And I'm just... You know, I'm not a great actor, but I know I know how to, I know how to build a foundation <clears throat> for a character. So, how <laughs> long did you how long did you do acting for? Uh, 
I started and say that was 1991 and I 20 years, 20 years. Wow. Yeah. I was with the greatest acting teacher, a guy named Wynn Hanman, mm -hmm. who was like the Raphael of acting teachers for 10 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And he passed away at almost a hundred years old, just a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, I started doing that, and that was I. I went at that to learn that with as much diligence as I did learning tailoring, and you have to. So, what was it so interesting about acting that you thought I have to take this seriously? See, that's a question. If if you if you went to if you, if I took you to one acting class, you'd say, "Oh, this is fun! I got to do this." Right. But I yeah. just happened to be in New York City, mm -hmm. where I could leave my shop on mm -hmm. 53rd street mm -hmm. and walk over to 57th and 7th to the greatest acting teacher in the world. I, mm -hmm. I could go from the greatest tailoring teacher in the world, Raphael, mm -hmm. and walk right over to the greatest acting teacher in the world, Wynn Hanman. So mm -hmm. New York City had a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. And you could be in plays and it was just there. It was there to learn. Mm -hmm. So that, and I'm just, I'm just a craftsman. I'm a craftsman. I like to learn crafts. I saw that you did. Uh, I don't know if you did this, but I saw a few illustrations on your Instagram. Did you make those? I don't know. You know that it was a children's book illustration. I did that too. <laughs> you you did that? I don't want to go into all that. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So tell and me I about like, that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm done learning things. I'm through. I'm through learning. <laughs> so how 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 did that happen? Just starting doing things, starting right. you know, a little spark. Yeah. A little yeah, coal. Yeah. yeah. The coal starts glowing and you just start learning. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, Frank, I, I have a list of things I've written down here based on our conversation. Uh, I'll I'll run them through are, with are, you. Who's, let me ask you something. Somebody asked me. I, I I thought maybe I was rude. Somebody wants to ask me about. They wanted to have a debate about machine made lapels and handmade lapels. Was that you? Uh, Which is you, what someone proposed it or? Well, they wanted me to argue with someone about is it better machine made lapels or. Hand roll mm. lapels. It wasn't you, so I don't have to apologize. Okay. No, no, no. That's okay. Well, we could talk about it for sure no, if no, you want. No, no, Somebody wanted it. Said, "Would you go on this and talk to somebody? He makes machine lapels, and you." And I said, "What? Why would I?" That's like asking an Italian grandmother, "Why is your sauce better than a can <laughs> of tomato tomato sauce?" Yeah, yeah. Would she, <laughs> would she even bother to argue? No. No. Okay. 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 No. All right. Uh, That's that's fine. I, I mean I don't do machine lapels, uh, so uh, whatever you do is fine. I just, you know. Sure, sure. Well, I I have a, I have a few list uh, a, a list of a few words, and I'll I'll run them through with you, and you tell me the first thing that pops up your mind, okay? And, and if you can, dangerous. go and, ahead. Well, well, say it in one word, okay? Say it in one word. You so, want you want me to give you one word answer? Yeah, one word oh, okay. answer. Yeah, okay. So. Let's start with maple syrup. Maple syrup, springtime in a jar. Beautiful. Most influential person. Raphael. Um, if you could make three improvements to the tailoring industry, what would that be? Go back a hundred years. Go back a hundred years. There's one. Just one. Go back a hundred years. Okay. Okay. Um, so apprenticeships versus tailoring schools. Uh, real life versus, um, well, I'd say the difference is learning from an old Italian grandmother or learning from a cookbook. Okay. Okay. Good stuff. Good stuff. So, um, one sign of a true master. Accio. Accio. Shorebirds. I think that's how you say I in Italian. I could yes. be wrong. No, that's true. That's true. That's okay. true. Okay. All right. Yeah. Shorebirds. 
Shorebird, God. God, interesting. Boom, how's that one? Yeah, very, very <laughs> good. Very, I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah. Bo boxing. Boxing, Carmen Basilio and Joe okay. Frazier. Carmen okay, Basilio yeah. and Joe Frazier. Smoking Joe Frazier. That's my answer. Okay. Um, favorite actor? Robert Shaw. Okay. And John Skype. Wayne. And, and John Wayne. And John Wayne. Okay. Skype. And Laurence Olivier. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Skype. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, the most important characteristic an apprentice should have. No other choice. No other choice. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, well, last but not least, Frank Shattuck. Oh, you don't want to know the word that just came into my mind. Schmuck. He's a schmuck. <laughs> he sits there all day and makes suits, and he doesn't have a damn any money in the bank. That's right. With this, but they warned me with the stitch, you never get rich. Mm. So Frank Shattuck, schmuck. <laughs> well that's not how i would end it i actually really enjoyed the conversation that's uh, you know i really enjoyed the conversation with you and you know I, when i when i saw the the anthony bourdain documentary and there was a scene where you guys were sitting in your workshop and you were working and he was just sitting there relaxing and i thought man I really should visit Frank one day and just sit in his workshop and just, you know, talk to him for like the entire day. So uh, yeah. we did a little bit of that here. But um, if I can, I will uh, love I would love to visit you. Uh, uh, you also day. notice in the Anthony Bourdain video. Raphael still coming up and telling me what to do. Yeah, I did. And you were asking he questions. Came up and, and told me the shoulders are a little wide. A little yeah. Wide. Yeah, oh. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, thank you, Frank. Thank you very much for for your time today. It was uh, it was a lovely conversation. I uh, enjoyed it a lot. I did too, Reza. Thank you very much. It was an honor and a pleasure. I'll do it anytime. Thank you. And that was Frank. I hope you all enjoyed the conversation. If you'd like to see more of Frank, you can follow the link to his Instagram page in the description of this video. If you have any thoughts, comments, or anything you'd like to share. Please let us know in the comment section and I hope to see you again in the next episode. Until then, bye bye.